Hey everyone, um, I got to do a blog this week, a podcast that uh, probably really didn't want to do that much. I started going down another road, but I felt like God led me down this road, so um, here we go. The title is, Sometimes Our Greatest Need is a Nervous Breakdown. I'm going to um, tell you a little something that Steve Brown said. I just love him. If any of you don't know who he is, you need to look up some of his quotes. They're awesome. This is what Steve Brown said to his students. When I taught at the seminary, I was often asked to address the new students. On more than one occasion, I said, your parents, church, pastor, and friends are all praying for your success. Just so you know, I'm not joining them. I'm praying for your failure. I'm praying that you get so overwhelmed by the academic work and by your neediness and sin that you seriously think about leaving and going into vinyl repair. Then God might use you and you'll learn to laugh, dance, and sing in the presence of God and in His grace and mercy. My friend Gwen introduced me to Steve Brown many years ago. God brought us, Gwen and I, together for many reasons. I believe one of them was so that he could smile as he watched the two of us meet at a restaurant and go from belly laughing to crying many times. People have wondered, I'm sure, I think somebody said it one time as they were leaving a restaurant, have wondered what we were drinking so early in the morning <laughs> that we were being so crazy together. People really would look at us because it's, it's truly just a wonderful relationship. Another reason he brought us together was because we needed each other. My life taught her to meditate on God's Word and believe Him for all things. And her life introduced me to the life-giving grace and love of God. My gratefulness cannot be expressed. After going through surrender and confessing so much sin, God and I were tight. I stuck to Him like glue. I was almost afraid to move. Being so image conscious all my life had taught me to hide who I truly was. When I uncovered all my hidden sin and was filled with God's Spirit, it was overwhelming and exhilarating. I started to try to make sure I'd never sinned because I was terrified of losing God's presence. No one can live on a tightrope like that. I had to learn that sin is never the problem. When my will became one with God's, that was where freedom was. Sin was just confessing sin was my path to humility because I was so full of pride. When we, when we live like that, we just become morbidly introspective, always looking for what we've done wrong, and it's miserable. So not long after surrender, God gave me a gift I didn't know I needed, which was Gwen. Gwen's life was a breath of fresh air. She never doubts how much God loves her. It's, it's beautiful, and she is a prayer warrior like nobody else. When somebody feels very loved by God, they want to be in His presence. She taught me about grace and not taking myself and my holiness so seriously. And before anybody starts to quote, without holiness, no one will see God, let me explain. Any holiness outside of the presence of God is not holiness, it is hypocrisy. Think about um, the mountain, Mount Sinai. Um, they had to put boundaries around it before Moses went up because that mountain became holy, but it was, on, it was just a mountain until God's presence came on it. God's presence made it holy. You think about when God told Moses to take off his shoes because he was on holy ground when the burning bush was there and God's presence was in that burning bush. He said, take off your shoes, this ground is holy. That ground was not holy. God coming to that ground made that, that ground holy. Me and you, we, were ne we will never have holiness except God. His presence is our holiness, period. We ain't holy, God is. We all, we all, A-L-L, -L, have a tendency to start by the Spirit and try to get better by human efforts. Listen to Galatians 3, 1 through 3. Let these words just wash over you. This is a New Living Translation, which makes it so plain. He says, oh, foolish to Galatians. This is Paul. I think reading scripture, Paul is one of the only people that I've ever seen that never went back into um, 
religion and trying to live by the flesh. He truly got the fact that we can't. I think it was so because he was so good at living by it, he did not get under that yoke again. So listen to this. He says, Oh foolish Galatians, exclamation point. Who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. Let me ask you this one question. Listen to this. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? Do you notice this word foolish quite often? After starting your new lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? For the child of God, we are invited, um, inviting a much needed nervous breakdown when this happens. What God says that we are to be is not hard. It is impossible. When I went into full-time ministry, coming here, I had walked with Jesus for over 20 years. I was usually the most spiritually mature person in the room, in my home. Although I submitted to my husband, everyone knew who the spiritual leader was. When I started working out my, outside of the home, um, I was around many unbelievers and very nominal Christians. Not all the people I worked with, some were dynamic Christians. but. Um, with my outgoing personality and the presence of God's Spirit, lots of people came to me for spiritual help and advice. They talked about me wonderfully. Everybody just thought I was so godly and all those kind of things. And I, I mean, I truly was walking with God. It wasn't like I, I was trying not to or to put on a face or anything like that. But I got probably a lot of attention, probably more than I should have. And it was wonderful on many levels, but it is deadly on others. Listen to 2 Corinthians 10, 12, when we don't have people in our lives to tell us the truth. It says, we, Paul said, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When, when we measure ourselves by ourselves and compare ourselves with ourselves, we are not wise. When we don't surround ourselves with people who are close to God and will call us out on hidden hypocrisy, we are not wise. Listen, nobody likes to hear it. Nobody. We all like to think we're a lot better than we are. When any of us get to the place where we know it all and we can't be taught, we are on the road to a nervous breakdown. <laughs> when God crushes our pride, it feels like he's crushing us. Or when God kills our pride, it feels like he's killing us. But he's actually crushing what is killing us. And Jordan Green said that. Paul would not have written to the Galatians about trying to be perfect by self-effort if it was not deeply ingrained in every single person on the planet. Paul even had to call out Peter. Peter. Paul was called later after Jesus was dead, buried, resurrected, and gone to heaven. Paul got called later. He never walked physically with Jesus. Peter walked physically with Jesus while he was on the planet. And Paul had to call him out on his hypocrisy at one point. Let this sink into your mind. It's, I've, I've looked at it with new eyes, and it's amazing. Galatians 2, 13 and 14. The whole book of Galatians is really about this. The, listen to what happened. The other Jews joined him, Peter. So you've got Peter is walking in hypocrisy. It says the other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy. So Peter is a leader. He's got these other leaders around him. When Peter started walking in hypocrisy, the other people around him started to walk in hypocrisy too. So that by their hypocrisy, all of them walking in hypocrisy together, even Barnabas was led astray. Hypocrisy just means a mask wearer. It's, if you look it up in Greek, that's what it is. It's wearing a mask. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, because anytime we are being hypocrites and acting a certain way, it takes away the truth of the gospel that Christ came to die for. So when I saw they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, <laughs> in front of them all, hypocrite loves it when they get called out publicly. 
He said, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Galatians 2, 13 and 14. Paul, <laughs> just throwing spiritual throat punches at Peter in front of all his peers. Peter was saved by grace, but it did not take away his need to be the man. He was wearing a mask and he was the main leader of God's early church. The move of God was incredible. He was sweeping through Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. And then he's got this huge leader who starts to walk in hypocrisy. A leader who wears a mask will automatically lead in such a way that others around them will start wearing a mask also. When we pretend we're doing great and we are not, others will not feel free to admit their weaknesses and depend on Christ. We will look to each other and compare ourselves with each other and ourselves and no one will look up to the only true help we have. When Paul saw this deadly gangrene spreading through the body of Christ, he was violent about it. He ripped Peter's mask off and left him exposed in front of all his fellow leaders. That's real love for God and for people when somebody will rip your mask off no matter what it costs because there's a scripture that says the wounds of a friend can be trusted but the, the kisses of an enemy cannot be. He loved God and Peter enough to expose him so God could heal him. Peter was a high achiever and he truly loved Jesus. He risked great things for him. He walked on water. He cut off a man's ear when he came to arrest Jesus in the garden. And I personally believe that he was trying to cut the man's head off. That's how much he loved Jesus. He wept bitterly when he denied Jesus. And when Peter saw Jesus, when he found out Jesus was on the land, when he was out in the boat with his friends and fishing, and somebody said, it's the Lord on the land, Peter jumped in the water and swam. He could not wait wherever Jesus was. Peter wanted to be there too. He was a great man of God. Jesus chose him to be a leader for many reasons. Not the least was his passion and desire to achieve great things for God as leaders. And we all lead someone. If you're a mama, you're leading your babies. If you're at work, you're leading people. All around us, we all lead people. We have to stay transparent and humble. So hard for us, so, so hard for us because people follow us. It's a huge temptation to get out of touch re with reality and start being what people want us to be and not what we really are. We are dust balls who need the Holy Spirit to do anything and everything of eternal value or temporary, temporary value. People naturally follow spiritual achievers because they want someone to represent God to them. People want someone they can see, talk to, and touch. People want heroes. And when it comes right down to it, there is only one true hero and his name is Jesus. No leader on the planet loves me or you like Jesus does. Yet people often prefer a person over his presence. Exodus 20, 17 and 18. When the people heard the thunder and the loud blast of the ram's horn and when they saw flashes of lightning and the smoke billowing from the mountain, they stood at a distance, trembling with fear because that was God's presence. And they said to Moses, and this is what people do still to this day, you, you speak to us and we'll listen, but don't let God speak directly to us or we will die. We prefer a person in between God and us instead of us going directly to God because his presence is hard. Let's be real. You can't lie to yourself in God's presence. And I wrote this blog for me, even if it speaks to no one else. I went through my own breakdown about a year ago. It was so hard and I preached a sermon called When Pride Looks Like Humility. And I'm still healing from all that. I thought I was above hypocrisy. I am not. None of us are. If the Apostle Peter started to people please, who do I think I am? 
If all the leaders in his circle got on the hypocrite wagon with him, who do any of us think we are? I hate, hate talking about stuff like this. I did not even enjoy writing this blog. Why? Because I am proud. I say, because deep down I'm proud. And the reason I say deep down is because we bury things we don't want people to see. We hide because we're all afraid of not being enough. I take so much solace from knowing God has put people all around me who will help me when they see pride ruining me and the people I lead. Someone called me out for saying, I don't have bad days. In my defense, of course, I said, I do have bad days, but I look at scripture above what I'm going through and I don't let the bad day rule me. I've tried to live like this for a long time because early on in my walk, things were falling apart. If I had looked at reality, I'm, I probably would have had uh, 10 nervous breakdowns, but I tried to exalt the word of God over my feelings. And that's a good thing in some ways and it's a bad thing in others. This is what he, that's what, this is what the person said to me. That's different from saying you don't have bad days. You are making where you seem to be walking an impossible place for others to achieve, and it is a discouragement to them. Ouch. That broke my heart. God will show us things, but we have to realize that God will use people to show us the things we cannot see in ourselves. I'm sure Peter would have preferred that God reveal his hypocrisy in the dignity of his quiet time, but he didn't. Peter couldn't see it. He needed Paul. When God deals with us on a deep level, it will be devastating. I wish I could tell people that total surrender will fix everything in our lives. It does not. It is the beginning of a long and narrow road in the same direction. All of us are going to try and take detours because they look like painless shortcuts. Let's be honest. We want to arrive at a, de at a destination. We just want to get there so that all the pain can be over, all the, all the stress and all the pushing in on us can be over. We just want to get there and arrive, but we will not, not on this side of eternity. So many leaders end up being exposed as frauds with a double life. I don't think most start that way. It all starts with a little dose of hypocrisy. Like yeast, it will end up permeating every part of us until we don't even know who we are. Hypocrisy is a mask. Just like I've said this before, my nails aren't perfect. They're fake. They're covered with something that doesn't show. My thumbs look horrible, but you can't tell because they have something fake over them. Anybody that looks like perfection, none of us are. It's fake. It's a mask. Whoever you are, you and I need truth tellers around us. Let people in and get real. That is so much easier said than done. We need each other. I've always said church needs to be a place where anyone at any time can stand up and say, I'm about to have an affair. Help me. Or I hate all of you and myself. Help me. Why don't we do these things? Well, pride, of course, plays a part, but we also have this great tendency, as Paul so beautifully stated, are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, you are now perfected by the flesh. The answer is yes, we are foolish like that. Self-effort will divide and conquer us. It takes us down a road of comparison instead of to the feet of Jesus where there is love and unity. We have to become unpretentious and honest like little children. And I do mean little. It doesn't take long for children to start playing the game of aren't I a good boy or girl? And it never stops there. It goes on to aren't I better boy or girl than him or her? Comparison, it always starts to happen. Jesus said this, these words truly. And when Jesus says truly, there is no getting around it. I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And I think that truly means when God has put his spirit in us, the road of sanctification, if you're truly a Christian, the road of sanctification will end up making you childlike. If it doesn't, 
Maybe you're not on the road of sanctification. Maybe you don't even belong to Jesus because he said you won't enter the kingdom unless you become like little children. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I want to be great in the kingdom of heaven. I don't think Jesus would have told us that if he didn't want us to aspire to that greatness. But it's going to come through transparency and realness, not acting like I'm a spiritual giant. The Christian life is rigged. No one can live it without Christ. We will eventually fall apart with self-effort. We are all the same. We are fragile. Every single day we need one thing. Our lives depend on it to be emptied of ourselves and filled with the Holy Spirit. When we live like that, people will be amazed at God, not us.